So what are those global trends? That capstone concept, an operational concept, affordable modernization, perhaps what do they mean for science and technology? Some of the emerging challenges from those global trends at a national and global level, I list here on the left, from education levels which are decreasing, an increasingly mobile network. Last summer, the number of email users and email messages in the mobile environment exceeded that of the desktop for the first time in our history, and the predictions are that this will continue uh, at a rapid rise. Information fusion. We've got, we've got increasing sources of information and an increasing need to bring that information together for uh, decision makers across business, commerce, uh, and industry, as well as within the military. Integrated products, not stovepipe products. Collectively, we're all concerned about securing our energy sources. Achieving mobility, strategic, operational, and tactical, is likely to become an increasing challenge as we've looked at the areas of instability around the world and whether or not there's a C-17 or C-130 capable aircraft within the majority of the land of that country. What we found is there's only about 25 percent of the landmass in these areas of instability from uh, the tri-border region to the stands to Indonesia uh, to places in Africa, for example. Um, only about 25 percent of the landmass can be accessed uh, to get you to a place within 50 kilometers of that airfield. Um, so the other 60, 75 percent of the land um, has to be accessed through some other means. And so strategic, operational, and tactical mobility will become an increasing challenge uh, either through the air, the land, or through river networks and the sea. Enhanced scalable lethality. We need to increasingly have the capability with that individual soldier to get the population's attention where I haven't been able to figure out the enemy from the adversary, from the competitor to the friend, as well as, when need be, kill or capture uh, that particular individual. So we need to give that soldier um, that uh, scalable kind of capability. And what does that result in, then, perhaps, for our S&T program? We've relooked these top five warfighter outcomes, which we've established about two years ago. And while the top five uh, are generally the same, uh, perhaps the order in which we attack these um, it ha has shown an increasing uh, need to get after training, to get after aspects of the human dimension and mission command. Uh, the counter IED and mine challenge, of course, uh, continues to be the number one killer of our soldiers deployed, and we must have the ability to detect and neutralize CBRNE obstacles and their components from a standoff distance. And if we cannot achieve that capability, then we must be able to protect our force through mobile armored protection, either for the individual dismounted soldier or for the mounted soldier. Mission command is an increasingly important idea and importance that is necessary to possess the ability to visualize, direct, describe, and lead forces in operations against a hostile thinking and adaptive enemy. We've got to leverage social networking and distributive, be able to distribute cognitive loads within that squad, within that company team rapidly, connecting that soldier to the network. We've got to leverage um, efforts such as apps for the Army, CSDA, connecting soldiers to, to digital applications, to get the whole network as much as possible mobile, be able to leverage commercial infrastructure when we get into that country so that we can reduce our own footprint that is bringing that infrastructure and relegate the infrastructure we need to carry ourselves to those forcible entry and access challenges that we have and not necessarily have to connect the whole Army through our own military infrastructure, increasingly, as I said, leveraging the commercial infrastructure since some 70 percent of the world is moving to urban populations and an equal percentage of the world has moved to 3G and 4G networks. Why can't we leverage those better? And we've got to overcome the information assurance challenge. 
And we've just seen now some indicators that industry has been able to achieve type one and type two uh, certification capability and software packages put on mobile devices. This is very encouraging um, so that we can get uh, our information trans trans uh, or communicated uh, on that network um, in an um, secure capability where necessary. Talking about training and the learning concept earlier, um, moving us from, again, the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. In power and energy, we, we need twice the power at, at half the weight on our individual soldier. We want to achieve that same kind of capability inside of our forward operating bases where our generators are our, mo our biggest user of fuel and our most inefficient due to um, various technologies that we haven't been able to apply yet that might allow us to get more uh, bang for the buck out of those generators. On the high end, combat platforms will require in the future up to 30 megajoules of pulse power for lethality and 20% increases in continuous power to enable superior tactical mobility, speed, as well as an excess capability needed for on and off-board electrical power uh, while increasing fuel economy by up to 40%. We want that off-board electrical power to help us uh, not only in tactical lethal uh, situations, uh, but equally as important are in humanitarian aid and peacetime military engagement type environments where if we can get military vehicles into a place uh, where we help establish security, perhaps we can also help establish some of those uh, refugee shelters and other activities that where power has not yet been restored to the civilian economy. Not only do these power and energy objectives help the individual soldier and the platform reduce the exposure uh, of the force by reducing the demand, but they also help us offload uh, physical loads and enable a more effective and efficient use of people resources. Let me shift a little bit to human dimension. As I mentioned earlier, we have to deal with the youth trends of the population of America that we're dealt with of today. We're 18 to 24 year old population. Um, over 75% of them cannot meet the DOD entrance requirements without a waiver. So we have to deal with this resource and figure out how do we take that baseline, which is as yet described, and then leverage uh, the potential of technology to help a soldier or a leader achieve his or her potential, not to make them some superhuman, but rather to uh, leverage that technology, understand the potential, perhaps test them differently, and then throughout their life cycle, develop them uh, in a coherent manner in a way in which they would achieve their potential. This is what the human dimension uh, integrated capabilities, uh, uh, initial capabilities document is trying to describe. In all three realms of what we're calling cognitive, physical, and social uh, capabilities. One of the most significant gaps in the human dimension is a lack of an established baseline for metrics. So we've got a lot of experts out there throughout the medical, behavioral, uh, leader development communities, and we need help in bringing that together to establish what the baseline is for the human so that we can better understand these tools that we need developed that focus on TBI, PTSD, and uh, soldier re resiliency, which ones are the most effective and which ones give us the best return on investment. Next chart. To achieve operational adaptability, TRADOC is helping the Army shift from a five-year to a two-year cycle. That big omnipresent five-year POM, long-range development planning cycle by examining our underpinning concepts every two years, identifying those gaps, interdependencies, and bringing recommendations now into the department for both the POM and the TAA on a much tighter time circle cycle. But the current trumps the future. The five-year plan and the desire for stability trumps near-term adaptability. The AAO and the APB 
will trump incremental strategy tied to R for Gen if we're not careful to achieve balance. The big guy will always win. Last chart. This shift calls for also a more adaptable science and technology development process, one that helps us shape the future but remains closely linked to the current fight. And I think as Marilyn, Marilyn Freeman has rightly stated, science and technology is an in integral part in everything we do and of all the programs we're working on, uh, just not that uh, distant future. It's critical for increasing knowledge and TRL levels for all of our PMs. We must have the right S&T investments uh, linked to those program outcomes, those warfighting outcomes, uh, better than we have in the past. We should be looking for a better way to connect the teams that work the future through 6163 S&T with the teams that are maturing the 6 to 68 research and development efforts to provide solutions to PMs for existing programs and holding people accountable throughout that process. Cost-benefit analysis, even in the S&T world, should be a part of determining what the right investment strategy is, what the right risk assessments are, and earlier in the requirements process. I've offered a few challenges to this great group today and appreciate your attention. Hopefully you have a better understanding of the global trends in the broadest national framework and that we can agree to set our sights on our global challenges and com competitors, not just ourselves or industry internally. And we understand where the Army is going and what we need to do to get help get the Army there and look for ways to better integrate our science and technology efforts to deliver the capabilities our soldiers need to fight today and tomorrow's conflicts. As I said, we're the only Army our nation has. Thank you very much.